Good, 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 good. All right. Good morning to everybody and welcome to our international audience. And today you have a treat. We're going to hear from a, from someone internationally, from another, uh, actually it's our 51st state, but we'll let that go. <clears throat> it's from Canada, which I'm is sure technically they, another country. I'm sure they appreciate being called the 51st state. Well, one of these days when I become president, we're going to, we're going to declare war on Canada and we're going to conquer it and take it over. Just thought I'd let you know, give you a heads up. <laughs> Wendy will vote for me. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> But anyway, it's good to see everybody. We've uh, got uh, uh, some good messages for you today, so be sure to listen very carefully. Let's ask God's blessing, and we'll get started. Father, thank you for each one who's here today, and for those watching online. We ask your anointing on the teaching and on the hearing today, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. From without further ado, from give uh, me just a couple the seconds Northwestern to get it. Territories in. We don't have them on the TV yet. No, and I got to get the camera set up to see the TV. In Canada, uh, can I go ahead and introduce him? Give me one sec. Okay. Let me get this lined up just right, because it's kind of hard to get the TV lined up and keep yeah. it lined up on you. Okay. Uh, Steve, by the way, is a is a graduate of Ambassador Christian College, and uh, a part time contributing uh, editor, a contributing writer to the Bible Truth, there and there he is. All right. There he is, Mr. Steve Harrison from Canada. Well, good morning and uh, greetings from your 51st state. <laughs> I, I, I guess the only thing I would remind Dr. Slau about starting a war with us is that the last time you did that, we had to come down there and burn your white house, and we wouldn't want to do that again. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be with you today. And uh, with your indulgence, I would like to continue on with uh, the discussion that we were having the last time uh, regarding the idea that Paul has in some ways done away with the law or taught that the law was done away. Uh, today I'd like to uh, look at another, uh, another saying of Paul that doesn't make any sense if, if that's actually true. Um, if you could turn uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, Corinth was uh, a major city, even by our standards today. It had a, a large, stable population, and it was a very wealthy city. Its wealth was based in no small part uh, on the fact that it was uh, a city with two ports. It had uh, a port on the river, which brought goods to Corinth, and it had a second port on the sea, which took products to uh, the rest of the empire and brought things in from the rest of the empire. So uh, there was a lot of money to be made here. And um, there was a large temple dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite in Corinth. Uh, Aphrodite is the Greek goddess of love, uh, the Roman equivalent of Venus, or the Babylonian Ishtar, or Easter, as we like to call her. Um, the way this would work is uh, you, you would uh, bring your offering to the temple, the, let's say your goat, you bring a goat to the temple, and the goat would be strangled, which was the form that they used to kill the sacrifice. Part of the sacrifice would be offered to the idol, and part would be prepared as uh, a meal. Uh, interestingly, the idol early ate its share of the offering, which uh, allowed the temple to take that offering and sell it in the local market. Um, the, the, this temple was uh, not unusual, but it was large and uh, the things that that allowed for was that it is said to have had a thousand temple prostitutes. And this was a major part of religion. So you would have your, your meal and then you would spend some time getting to know the uh, priestess better. Um, if, if you remember a small rabbit trail, uh, the uh, Book of Acts, uh, Jerusalem Conference in Acts 15, uh, the question of circumcision, James issues his ruling, and then he has a better set of the 
churches. And uh, there are four things that he feels it's important to tell the new Gentile uh, converts about. And if you remember what those four things were, it was meats that had been offered to idols, blood, and, and this is of course because in strangling the sacrifice, it wasn't blood properly, uh, things strangled, and fornication, all major parts of the Greek religion. And this is the backdrop to, to which uh, Paul is writing the church in Corinth. So he, he had been in Corinth, he had spent a good deal of time there, and he in fact raised up the church there. He's moved on since then, and uh, he's heard something that's going on in Corinth that disturbs him. And it isn't something that's happening up at the uh, Temple of Aphrodite. It's something happening right down here in the Corinth Church of God. Uh, and he writes to the church. So beginning in verse 1, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, there had been a law in the Old Testament that said it was an abomination for a man to have his father's wife, but if Paul is now teaching that the law is done away, what exactly is the problem? He clearly has an issue with it, and the teachers today who say that the law is done away would have to tell us what exactly is his issue, since without law there's no sin. Dr. Smile last week brought us a message uh, about a, a teacher, a, a mega pastor, in one of the large churches, I think it has something like uh, 34,000 members, who is teaching that adultery is not don't want to do it necessarily because you might get caught but if you don't get caught well, what difference does it make paul in every letter every epistle he writes does not agree with that there there is no way you can read what paul actually wrote and believe that he and these teachers today are teaching the same thing. It, that's just not possible. So the question becomes this. Do we follow these teachers today who say that the law is done away, or do we follow what you can find in your own body? Peter summed it up quite well when he said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, men, more than God, you judge. Thank you, and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate it. Oh, by the way, before you, turn, now. before you turn him off, have you already turned him off? No, I haven't turned him off yet. We're going we're gonna to excommunicate your cat. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was closed up in the bedroom and obviously got the door open. Oh, mercy. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my little puppy will find a way to get in the house if he can. He wants so. to hear the word. He wants to hear the word, yeah. Well, he can be on camera. That's a religious cat. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Steve. We he appreciate just it. He needs to get saved a little. <coughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of work. Okay. All right. I well, I'm going to flip you around and then I'm going to cut him off. You good at flipping off people? Oh, flipping me around. I'm sorry. I'm going to let that one go and not have a comeback. You'll have to edit that out. Um, anyway, good morning to everybody. Morning. Glad for that message. Um, you see, you think I'm weird because I teach that we should obey God, and I'm not, the, I'm not the only weird person that believes that way. I mean, the other people also believe we should obey the commandments of God. And the last nine chapters of Ezekiel talk about that when Christ returns and sets up the kingdom, it says, and you will be observing the Passover. It says you're going to be um, 
you're going to be uh, keeping uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And Zechariah 14 talks about all nations will keep these holy days. Yeah, it's pretty lovely. So I'm not the only one that's doing that. Now, I want to make an announcement here before we get into the message today. This Thursday is the Feast of Trumpets. For those of you who are still uh, maybe questioning what that is, God said uh, on the first day of the seventh month, which every month begins with a new moon, you're to have a holy day. And this, the, they, they actually, the priest, not the laity, but the priest would actually blow trumpets. I'm not a Levitical priest. I'm not going to blow any trumpets. I don't even own a trumpet. I have a question about that. Ian. Okay. And, and so, uh, but God said the priest wouldn't do that. But the lay people would take off from work, which, you're, which God commands us to do. That's this coming Thursday. By the way, Wednesday night at, at sundown, watch for the new moon. Now, we have a master's class here, and I'm going to take everybody a break. We're going to go out through the North Park, lot. the ones that care to go out and look at it, and we're going to do what God says. We're going to observe the new moon. You see that little baby moon in the west just after sundown, about 15, 20 minutes after sundown. You'll know that, um, that, the, that that's the beginning of the month. And also, we have uh, reports from Israel. They're east of us, so they see the new moon before we do. And um, so, anyway, you know, let me, let me tell you this. Now, my message is not about the holy days today. Uh, but let me tell you this. This is the only holy day that we have to really watch the new moon because it's the only one we're not sure about. Uh, the, the new moon of Abib, if we miss it by one day, we can, we can fix it because we got two whole weeks before Passover comes up. But if you miss this one, you're going to be off. And the Feast of Trumpets pictures the second coming of Christ. And you've got to be watching for him not physically with your eyes because you won't see him today in the clouds but but spiritually you've got to be watchful luke 21 36 watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy uh, to, to escape all these things and to stand before the son of man we got to be watchful so the feast of trumpets is the only holy day that every year we can't be absolutely sure until we see the new moon now so we actually do not know for certain that that's going to be the Feast of Trumpets until we see the new moon. But according to astronomers, mathematicians, they calculated, they got these computer tables, 99% of the time they're accurate, but we still have to verify it by actually observing the new moon as it comes in Jerusalem. So they're seven hours ahead of us, so what I started to say was uh, on the computer, I go on that Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon by 3 o'clock, they will have already observed the new moon. Now, if for some strange reason they don't see it, then it will be the following day. Now, I know it's going to throw everybody off if you're trying to get off from work. I understand that. Yes, that will mess up my dates. That will mess up all the dates. But it's interesting. This is the only holy day that we have some question about as to when it comes. Now, I know a lot of stuff about the Bible, but there's one thing. If you say, Keith, when's Jesus coming back? I don't know. Give me the day and the hour. Give me the year. I don't know. Will it be morning or afternoon? I don't know. See, so this is the only holy day that you have to actually watch for, truly watch for. Yes, ma'am. Why did the Jewish people think it was last month? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Why did the Jewish people think it was last month? They go by a mathematical calculated calendar that was invented in the mid-fourth century by Hillel II, and he did it. He did that by coercion from the Roman government. They said. Stop observing the new crescent because every time they do that, they send up smoke signals. And the Samaritans would deliberately do it one day early to mess them up. So they said, we're tired of this. You're, you're messing up Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. You're going, to get, you're going to have a war over there. It's just a matter of time. So come up with a whole different calendar. So Hillel obeyed the authority, came up with a man-made calendar, and the Jews got in the habit of doing it. Let me read you something from the new Sanhedrin that's now in Israel. Let me tell you what they say. Quote, I won't read you the whole thing. Just listen to this one statement here. It is certain that we will no longer be permitted to use the mathematical calendar of Hillel II in the near future. What are they waiting on? They're waiting for, the, for them to build the temple. Now listen to this statement. There is a requirement from the Torah. Does anybody not know what Torah is? That's the five books, the law, the five books of Moses, the Torah. It, there is a requirement from the Torah that Pesach, that's the Hebrew word for Passover, come out two weeks after, listen, the first new moon of spring. Well, this year, the Jewish calendar started with the last new moon of winter. That's why they're a month early. They started with the last new moon of winter. Now, if you go with the first new moon of spring, the new moon was not in March. It was in April. So April, May, June, July, 
August, September, October is the seventh month. God said the first day of the seventh month you're going to observe the Feast of Trumpets. You have it. Yes. And you said that the priests were the ones that blew the trumpets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that the only time the priests could blow the trumpet or could lay people blow a trumpet before Sabbath, weekly Sabbath services? Because the rabbi down here mm -hmm. has some has occasionally, not every week, mm -hmm. but occasionally had one of his lay people I'm assuming it's a lay person because it's a woman. We'll go out there. We'll go. Don't give me that right now. That's an assumption. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> and know. she'll be out there blowing a trumpet. I'll be honest with you. I have not studied the, the rituals of the Levitical priesthood that much because I'm German. Okay. So, but uh, the priests did, uh, the priests and the Levites, the Levites being lay people, uh, the men, the Levites, would blow the trumpets at different times of the year. Uh, in Numbers chapter 10, you'll see there were seven different occasions. Mm -hmm. The Feast of Trumpets was, well, actually God said the first day of every month they were to blow trumpets. But this was the Feast of Trumpets. There was a lot of blowing of trumpets on this day. In fact, the Jews call it Yom Teruah, which means the day of, of blowing, I think, was the blowing of trumpets. Because what they'll do is go out there and holler Teruah and then blow it. Yeah. And then Teruah and blow it. Yeah. But yeah. if this is a man, then he needs to stop wearing dresses. Okay. Stop well, anyway, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know that it's wrong for them to, to, to do that anytime they want to. But on, but the priest did it on the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. I just didn't know if that was just the rule or then or. I'm not a priest. I'm not a Levite. I'm not an Israelite. I'm a Gentile by birth. And I'm by, by new birth. I'm a, I'm a Jew. And so are you, by the way. All of you are Jewish if you're born again. Um, and I know some people think you're not born again until the resurrection. And that's partially true. It's not entirely true. So anyway, he said there's a requirement from the Torah that Passover come out two weeks after the first new moon of spring, which is what we're doing. So the Sanhedrin even agrees with what we're doing. Because we're going strictly by the Torah. Now, if you go by Jewish tradition, Jesus said, if you lay aside the commandment of God to hold to your own tradition, all of your worship is in vain. So the Jews are worshiping God in vain and don't even realize it. So I just thought I'd bring that and share that with you. In fact, here's an article, a picture of the New Crescent Moon, and the title of the article is, Is the Jewish Calendar Wrong? I got that off the internet. And yes, it is. It is wrong. <clears throat> and the Sanhedrin said, we're going to wait until we build the temple. And uh, here it says, here's a from the Sanhedrin, it says, at this time, no change in the calendar is expressed or implied. They have no, ch no intentions of changing the calendar until the temple is rebuilt. But like I read to you a few weeks back, uh, in August, uh, Gershon Solomon said, if we don't build the temple, this Tisha B'Av, which is a Hebrew term for the term when the temple was destroyed, Anciently, if we don't build it now, we'll certainly have it built by the next Tisha B'Av, which was by the next August. So they're planning to rebuild the temple in the next 12 months. Man, we all this church ought to be overflowing. We we should have so many people coming here to hear this that we can't get them in the door, because you know the people driving up and down the street out there they don't know that how close we are to the world's greatest tribulation. There are some that are saying that the year 2019, there's going to be a giant downturn. That's next year in the economy. Right now, the economy is booming. More jobs, and we're talking about in America. Was great. Yeah, everything was great in 2018, but some are saying now by 2019, it's going to be such a giant downturn. It's going to be, it will start what will become the worst depression America has ever had. If our, if we have a great depression like they had in the late 20s and early 30s. And no worse than that, economically, it would still be worse for you because you're not. People back then had chickens. They had family gardens. They didn't go hungry. Most. How many of you have a family garden? Be honest. Not one of you. Not this year. How many of you have chickens? Not one of you. My neighbor does. I can go pick one. So here's the thing. Ten commandments aren't in effect. I can still get chicken. That's right. Because still eggs and everything else. If the ten commandments are not in effect. But the, but the fact of the matter is, where are people in our big cities going to do? They're going to starve. There's going to be riots. They didn't have riots in the 1930s. People had family gardens. Today, if the depression is no worse than the 30s, economically speaking, financially speaking, it's still going to be worse for the American people. And that's the beginning 
That's the that's not the tribulation itself. That's the beginning. So what I'm saying is the people out here on the street couldn't care less. They don't want to hear about it. They're not in church. They're going about their the, the cares of this life. We've had nearly 300 people to graduate from this school. Where are they all? They should be right here. Yes, sir. They don't believe what now? They don't believe in right things anymore. Yeah. There's what well, Paul said in the last days will be an apostasy and folks, it's already set in. Yes, sir. Well, Pastor, you know, they didn't believe the flood was coming until the water started coming down. You That's know? right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that brings up something. For those of you uh, online who didn't hear what he said, he said they didn't believe in the flood until the rain started. <laughs> but <coughs> something you have to keep in mind. God shut in Noah a week before the first drop of rain fell. Well, that's why he tells me to build that temple. When they see that temple, they know it's time to get ready. Yeah. When they see the temple, then they'll start getting ready. But what if God makes up his list of people he plans to protect before the first stone is laid? What if right now, this year, 2018, God is making out a list of the Philadelphians who are ser serving him, tithing to his ministry, supporting his work, being a part of it, keeping God's laws and then when the temple is actually, when they start to rebuild it, God will say, well, I'm sorry, now you waited too late. Did you have another? Well, they still not going to believe after they build the temple. Some of them not going to believe. Oh, absolutely. Some of them will not believe because. There's going to be a, a, a multi-majority of people that ain't even going to pay no attention to that temple. That's exactly right because it says when Jesus comes back, it'll still be a shock to the world. They're still not expecting That's it. That's right. Oh, well, we've had depressions before. We'll get over this one. But this one's going to be the worst since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Well, when does it start? Three and a half years after the first sacrifice is given in Israel. And people won't even realize it when the Antichrist is getting the whole thing. Yeah. Well, it says even the elect could be deceived if possible, meaning if possible for me, if possible for you and you and you and you. In other words, if it's possible, even the elect, that's us, will be deceived. You say, well, how can I be deceived? All those great miracles being done and all that. Wow, that's got to be the power of God. And you better be careful. Yes, sir. You know, the people that read the Bible right now, they don't believe what they read. Yeah. You know, just like in uh, Malachi 4 and 3, it says that the wicked Which is going to be burned up. The yeah. wicked is going to be burned up, and we're going to walk on the ashes. Well, well, people in the church, I just had that conversation with somebody Wednesday. Yeah. People in the church don't believe that. They don't. No, they don't. They say that God is going to give them the precious gift of eternal life. Well, they say that they, uh, if people are going to be put in hell and they're going to be screaming and hollering the colonel. The Lord not going to listen to nobody hollering and screaming for no eternity. Yeah. Got all carried away. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, let's get into uh, today's uh, message. I want to ask you a question. By the way, we will have service at 1030 on each of these holy days. Uh, this Thursday, then the following is Saturday. That's the Day of Atonement. That's the one that most people don't really look forward to. That's the day of fasting, the whole day from sundown to sundown. And then five days later, the following Thursday on the 25th, will be the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a feast. We ought to go out that day to go and corral somewhere and just pig out. But don't eat any pig. And then a week later is the last great day. If you don't come to any of these Holy Day services, you make sure you come on the last great day. It's the, one of the greatest and most beautiful messages that's ever fallen on human ears. Not because I preach it, but because it comes out of this book. And, the, and right at 100% of the churches out here have never heard it. What day is the first one? Uh, that's a Thursday, too. Yeah. That's the last it's great Thursday, day. Thursday, then skip a Thursday, and then two more Thursdays yeah. in a row. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Acts chapter 13. I won't ask you to turn to all these scriptures, but I'm going to ask you a very important question today. And the bigger the church is, the milkier of their messages because take for example some of these churches that have 30,000 people in them if the preacher suddenly got up and started preaching doctrine he'd lose two thirds of his audience because they wouldn't like the doctrine he's preaching for example out of all those thousands of people you know there are people out there that believe in sprinkling for baptism if he got up and said the bible says immersion well he'd lose all those people the following week he'd get up and talk about something else he'd lose this group next thing you know he's down to a size like we got here so that's why they don't get into doctrine. If you listen, like Stephen Fertig and some of these others, most of what they preach is not actually Bible doctrine. It's you can make it type speeches. It's Christian motivation. You can do it. You will succeed. 
God is with you. God loves you. He really does. Amen. You could preach that in a Jehovah's Witness church, a Mormon church, or a Catholic church because there's nothing doctrinal at all about those messages. Unfortunately for you, uh, when you come here, we get into doctrine. The Bible is loaded with doctrine. They're preaching the miracle of prosperity. Yep. They preach something that it feels good and you like to hear it and it makes you excited. Uh, Isaiah 30 verse 10 says, Preach unto us smooth things, something that goes down easy. Don't tell me I've got to give up anything. And today I'm going to ask you some very hard questions. And I don't want you to answer me out loud because they're going to be very private, very personal questions. So do not answer out loud. Just think about it. And if you're not sure of the answer, go home and think about it. Acts chapter 13 and verse 22 and when he had removed him, he raised up them, David. He removed Saul because Saul had gotten the big head and he became pride, prideful, proud of heart. And he removed him, and then God raised up to them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, I love reading the Psalms. If you want to know why David was a man after God's own heart, all you got to do is read Psalms. David loved God. The greatest commandment is to love God. The greatest commandment is not let your land rest every seventh year and, and uh, you know, even to tithe. Or the greatest commandment is not to turn the other cheek. The greatest commandment is to love God and do it with all your heart. Why is it that David was a man after God's own heart? When you read the Psalms, you see, and we're going to take a look at a few of the Psalms today to see why David was a man after God's own heart. And then I'm going to ask you some very, very tough questions that I hope all of you have an answer for, but I would bet the majority of you don't have the answer. That's why I don't want you to answer out loud. Now let's find out why David was a man for God's honor. I'm going to go to uh, 1 Samuel 13. You're welcome to turn back there if you want to, or you can just listen. But 1 Samuel 13, Joshua, Judges, and then Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14 says... Samuel's talking to Saul. Saul messed up. He goofed up. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The eternal, had, now every time you see the word Lord in capital letters, it's the Hebrew name translated the eternal. Uh, people try to pronounce it as Jehovah. Some pronounce it as Yahweh. Nobody knows the ex exact pronunciation. The fact that there are so many different pronunciations is proof positive that nobody actually knows the true pronunciation. But we know oh, there's a consensus even at Hebrew University as to what it means. It means the one who is eternal. And that's what his name means. The eternal, or you could translate it, the eternal one, has sought him a man after his own heart, and the eternal has commanded him to be captain over his people. All right, so chapter 16, and that was chapter 13, verse 14, and then chapter 16 of 1 Samuel and verse 7. But the eternal said to Samuel, look not on his countenance. Now, God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. One of his sons is going to be the next king. So he said, have all your sons come in here. Here's this big, tall guy. He said, that's the man right there. I can tell. I can spot a king a block away. God said, don't look at his countenance. Don't look at his countenance. Or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the eternal sees not as a man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, talking about Samuel, but the eternal looks on the heart. And so all the sons of Jesse passed before Samuel, and God said, no, not him, not him. Well, there's got to be this one. No, it's not him. Well, it must be this one's not him. And all the sons went by. And, Je and, and Samuel said, I know God told me to, that one of your sons was going to be king. And here are all your sons, and God refused them all. So he looks at Jesse and said, are these all your sons? Yep, that's, well, except for David, but you don't want him. <laughs> David was so little thought of by his own family, they wouldn't even invite him in to see the local prophet. Here is, here is the great prophet Samuel. They didn't think enough of David. They said, stay out there with the sheep. Don't come in here and mess up because the prophet's going to be here. We don't want you in here. So all the other sons come in, and they're all dressed up looking nice for Samuel. Well, where's David? Oh, he's out with the sheep. We didn't want him to come in. And so they bring David in. And David walks in and he sees all these men, his brothers and his dad and the prophet, they're all staring at him like this. And David said, oh dear, what have I done now? <laughs> they even got the prophet after me. Now what? No, I must have done something really bad. 
when Samuel and when when David comes in, God tells Samuel that's the man, and it shocked everybody because you see he didn't look like a king. This little freckle faced kid, you know, didn't look like what they thought a king should look like. Do you know what they told Ronald Reagan way back in the fifties? They were going to do a movie. I forget the name of the movie now, but it was about somebody becoming president of the United States. And Ronald Reagan was considered for the role, and the producer turned him down. They said, you don't look presidential. <laughs> they did. They told him, you just don't look like a president. They turned down Ronald Reagan. And in real life, he became president of the United States and won two landslide elections. Go figure. Yes, ma'am. But you just turned down Jesus. Yeah. He didn't look like their king. <clears throat> yeah. Jesus didn't look like what they were thinking from a, a Messiah. They thought a Messiah would look different. Okay, we have a, an important prayer request, which remind me to take at the end of the, of the message today. So, 1 Kings chapter 11, the next book over, I want to read to you what that says. In verse 38, chapter 11, in verse... Well, Pastor, you know... Yes. <clears throat> when David went out to kill Goliath, what did they do? They scorned him. Yeah. His brothers talked against him. And, yeah. Uh, Saul told him that, uh, you know, he was too young to go out and fight yeah. a man of war. Yeah. All of them scorned him. They, and he did it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, one of his brothers said, you just came down here to see the fight. And he, he said, what fight? Y'all are scared. <laughs> what fight? You're all hiding in the trenches here. So he goes out there, a little upstart, goes out there with the sling, says, I'll kill him. He tried to get him his armor. Saul tried to get him his yeah. armor. Yeah. He says, I don't want this armor. I don't need it. Yeah. So he took a sling, not a slingshot, but a sling. And a sling, they actually still use slings over there in the Middle East. It's like a um, st strip of leather. They put a rock in it, and they sling it around. And then they let go of part of it, and they have learned how to accurately hit something, hit a target. And David was out there at the sheet, and that's all he had time. He didn't have a cell phone with him. So he just stood out there and played and practiced and practiced and practiced because he was in case a wolf comes up. So he was pretty good at a sling. So here's a Goliath. He said, well, he's no different than a wolf. Whoosh, hit him right in the forehead, knocked him out. Didn't kill him, knocked him out. So then he took the sword of Goliath and chopped his head off, held up the head of Goliath to the Philistines, said, look what I just did. And the Israelites ran out of the trenches and ran after the Philistines. Chapter, thir chapter 11, verse 38. <clears throat> it shall be if you will hearken unto me in all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do that which is in my sight, Right in my sight, keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did. If you'll do this, he's talking to Jeroboam, who becomes the first king of the ten tribe kingdom of Israel. If you will keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did. Now, why was David a man after God's own heart? He kept God's law. He kept God's commandments. He said, and I'll build you a sure house. Not because you're so nice looking, but because you are obedient to me. That's why I'm going to do this. In chapter 2 of 1 Kings, let me go back there for a moment. When David was dying, he gave his son Solomon a commandment. Chapter 2 and verse 3, he, he tells Solomon, well, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2 of 1 Kings, I go the way of all the earth, meaning he was about to die. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep, verse 3, keep the charge of the eternal thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written. Do it exactly the way it's written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn yourself. That's what David did. Now you can get an idea of why he was a man for God's own heart. Why is it that churches today and men in general do not wish to obey God's law? The Apostle Paul says, and I won't turn there, but Romans 8, verse 7, it says, The reason is the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity, meaning it's hostility, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, the carnal mind, neither indeed can be. Well, then why are you here today? Because your carnal mind is enmity against God. But now 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says we have the mind of Christ. You got the carnal mind on one side, the mind of Christ on the other, and you have the deciding vote, and you have decided to follow the mind of Christ, and so you're here in church today. But the carnal mind says, I don't want to do that. The carnal mind says, oh, that was all done away. The carnal mind says, I am not going to be subject to the law of God. But when Jesus comes back, carnal or not, they will be or they'll die. Remember, what is it, uh, Luke 19, I think it's verse 27, when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom, he said, bring all those people that don't want me to 
to rule over them, bring them here, slay them. Ouch. So don't be carnal minded. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 18. Here is the solution then. Chapter 18 in verse, excuse me, <clears throat> where am I seeing? Verse 3, okay. Now this is what Jesus said. He said, verily, that's an old English word that means truly, I say to you, except you, talking to grown men now, in fact, he's talking to his disciples. Look at verse 1. He, the disciples came to him. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? He's only talking to the disciples. Except you disciples, Luke 10, 20 says their names are written in the book of life already because they believed on Jesus. Except you become converted and become as little children, you, my disciples, shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I believe that every one of you have your names written in the book of life. I believe that. But unless you allow God to convert you, to change you, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, whosoever, that's John, that's Jane, that's Mary, that's Fred, Whosoever, that's you, I can name you by names. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child. Little child. We're talking a one-year-old, no more than maybe a two-year-old. They're just, they believe anything you tell them. They're humble. You can tell a little child about Santa Claus, and they don't even question you because you're their parent. They believe everything you say. Unless you humble yourself and believe what God says, believe everything he says. Unless you, as a grown adult, humble yourself and become like a little child. You're not going to make it into the kingdom of God. You say, well, I'm all, my name's already in the book of life. I don't need to hear this. No, wait a minute. He's talking to people whose names have already been written in the book of life. How converted are you? I won't ask you to turn there. But convert means to change. We, because we all have carnal minds. Carnal means fleshly. We're all born with a carnal mind. Every one of us. Jesus, this is going to make you upset. Jesus had a carnal mind. Oh, you shouldn't say that. No, it's true. Because he was flesh and blood. He was carnal. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are. Here's the difference. He had a carnal mind, but he submitted his entire life to the mind of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, when you got saved, God gave you the Holy Spirit. You now have the mind of Christ in you. All you've got to do is, let me explain what I mean. All you got to do is yield to that mind. You've seen the cartoons. You've got the good angel on one side and the bad angel on the other. And, and somebody does something to the cartoon character, and the bad angel says, kick him. And the good angel says, no, no, you can't do that. So usually the cartoon character submits to the bad angel. All right, somebody, if I walk up and slap one of you, I'm not going to do it. Your carnal reaction is to slap me back and knock me on the floor. If it was Mr. Daniel, you'd have me on the floor. It'd probably knock me back. But that's the carnal mind. The spiritual mind, the mind of Christ, says, turn the other cheek. You have the deciding vote. See, we all have carnal minds. A knee-jerk reaction. Sometimes you don't even think about it. You step on my foot and I go, what? oh, excuse me. That's the carnal mind. The spiritual mind is the one I need to be yielded to so that it becomes second nature for me to automatically turn the other cheek. Not just physically, but if there's character assassination, you're out here lying against me and so I need to turn the other cheek then too. See, that's acting like Jesus, becoming like Jesus. Unless you're converted, you whose names are in the book of life, I'm talking to everybody in this room, except you be converted. Convert means you've got to change and become like a little child. You're never going to enter the kingdom. Ouch. I wish I hadn't come to church today. I didn't want to hear this. That's why we have a small crowd and some of these others have thousands because they don't hear this in their church. And I'm not done yet, so don't anybody leave. Revelation 3.19, I won't turn there, but Jesus said, I chasten those whom I love. He will chasten you. He will punish you if he loves you. He will try to correct you. Conversion means you're being corrected. Now listen, you may want to turn with me to Jeremiah. There's several scriptures I'm going to read from Jeremiah. Chapter 2, or you may just want to write this down. Look it up later. Chapter 2 and verse 29. Wherefore will you plead with me, says God? You all have transgressed against me, says the Eternal. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. I smote you 
I have chastened you, but it was all in vain because you didn't receive correction. God wants us to be corrected. Chapter 5 of Jeremiah, turn, turn one page over to verse uh, chapter 5 and verse 3. O eternal, are not your eyes upon the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. The idea was to grieve, to humble themselves. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They've made their faces harder than a rock. They've refused to return, meaning to repent. Their faces become hard. You ever picked up a little baby and he's stubborn and he's crying and he's stiff as a board? Pick him up and you try to do something with him. He's just stiff as a board. The Bible talks about being stiff-necked. And adults can be that way. And God says, look, I'm trying to correct you. Chapter 7 and verse 28. But thou shalt say to them, this is a nation that obeys not the voice of the eternal their God, nor receives correction. Truth is perished and cut off from their mouth. They're not even speaking the truth. Then finally, in Jeremiah 10, a, few, a couple of pages over, Jeremiah 10, verse 23, one of my favorite scriptures. O Lord, correct me. No, let me go back to verse 23. That's verse 24. Verse 23, O Lord, or in Hebrew, O eternal, I know that the way of man is not in himself. New age or self, just follow your heart. Better not do that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart of man is deceitful above all things. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Well, then how do we get corrected? Verse 24, O eternal, correct me. That's how we, we get a course correction. It's not in your heart to do the right thing. So we're asking God to correct us. Now, how does God correct us? We're going to get into that very briefly here. <clears throat> pilots, especially in small aircraft, I don't know about the big jets, but pilots make course corrections. Mr. Daniel has been a pilot. He can vouch for this. They make course corrections about every 15 minutes. Isn't that right? But you're supposed to. When I was a student, sometimes I'd forget and I'd get way off course. Well, you're looking at your, your you know, you got your, your artificial horizon here, you've got your compass and everything. But if you don't set it to the real compass there on the dashboard, your, your gyro compass will get off a little bit. And so every 15 minutes, you look at that compass and you set your instruments according to the true compass. And if you don't do that, I bet every 15 minutes, you'll get off course. I flew to uh, Norfolk, Virginia one time, and the tower told me, turn left heading such and such a degree, and I was way off. I was like 15 or 20 degrees off, and that's dangerous at an airport when all these airplanes are coming in, I'm going the wrong direction. I needed correction. You know what happens if a pilot doesn't take correction? He gets killed. He crashes his airplane and kills his passenger and kills a lot of other innocent people, too. It's not something to play around with. I made a bad mistake. Now, nobody reprimanded me for it, but, brother, I said, that's not going to happen again. The next time I'm in an airplane, every 15 minutes, I'm getting a course correction. Why does Keith Slough need a correction? I'm a wonderful pilot. I've actually been told that by instructors, at least one I know of. He said, you're, a, you're an excellent pilot. Maybe, but I need correction and if you ever start to fly airplanes you remember that you give yourself a correction about every 15 minutes what about spiritually well I don't need correction I got it all made I've arrived yeah well maybe you have arrived but you still need correction David was a man for God's own heart did he ever make mistakes yeah did he need correction oh yeah he did but he was a man for God's own heart he needed correction well what about you what about you what about us do we need correction? Absolutely we need it. Now here's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16. In fact, I will turn over there and read it because it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it's such a beautiful verse. He says in verse 16, all scripture now, when he was talking about all scripture, verse 15, he said, you've known from a child the holy scriptures. The only scriptures Timothy had as a child was the Old Testament. You have known the Holy Scriptures from the time you were a child, and all Scripture, that's from Genesis to Malachi, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. The Old Testament is profitable for doctrine? That totally contradicts what some of these major pastors are saying nowadays. It's also for reproof, and it's also all Scripture is profitable for correction. 
How do you get corrected? Well, you go to Tim LaHaye and ask him to teach you about the rapture. No, you don't go to Tim LaHaye or Perry Stone, who teaches the same stuff. You don't go to Hal Lindsey. You go to the scripture. Now, the New Testament today would be included in that, but certainly, specifically, it was referring to the Old Testament. All the scriptures that Timothy knew from the time he was a child, Genesis and Malachi, is profitable for us. Hey, this was written, look at the date at the top of the page, AD 66. 35 years after the cross, Paul says, all scripture is, present tense, profitable. Not used to be before the cross. Today, right now, in the new covenant, all scripture is profitable for doctrine and for correction. So if I want to know what day of the week I'm supposed to rest on and worship on, I go to the scriptures for correction. And if that wasn't important for us to know, it wouldn't have been in the Bible. It wouldn't have even been in the Bible. That the man of God may be perfect. If you want to be perfect, listen. Nobody here claims to be perfect. I said, raise your hand if you're perfect. Nobody would do that. But if you want to be perfect, you let the scripture correct you. If you want to be a perfect pilot, don't go by. If you fly by the seat of your pants, you know this, Mr. Dan. You know what they tell you when you fly by the seat of your pants? You won't live long. You don't fly by the seat of your pants. You fly by your instruments. You make sure you pay attention to that compass. You listen to the tower. If you fly by the seat of your pants, you're not going to live very long. There are bold pilots who fly by the seat of their pants, and there are old pilots, they tell us. But there's no such thing as an old, bold pilot. If you're bold, you won't live long. Don't be bold. Be humble, and you'll live a long time. That's why he's still alive. And that's why I'm still alive, and I've made a lot of mistakes. Thankfully, none that was very, very serious, because I haven't crashed an airplane yet. I've come close to it, but I haven't crashed one yet. Yes, sir? I, I learned a lesson really from close. fixing the compass. Uh-huh. Ooh, 40 miles off course. Yeah, that's easy to do. Yeah. That's fine. But you just said that you, from then on, you just make sure. Yeah, there are two things you do. You use pilotage. You look out the window, and uh, you, you know that river's supposed okay. to be out here, right. and it's not there. And you think, well, where's that river supposed to be? <laughs> you know you're off course. And then you use your, your compass and your radio navigation and so on. So all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. Now, in the time I have left, if you want to go back with me to Psalms, that would be good because I'll, I want to start with Psalm 119. And I'll do this quickly. Psalm 119, <clears throat> verse 9, says, How shall a young man, the, the King James says, wherewithal, <clears throat> that's an old word that means how. How shall a young man cleanse his way? And there's the, the answer right there, taking heed according to God's word. You take heed according to God's word. Now, when I was a teenager, this, this passage, starting in verse 33, was given to me to pray. This, now, scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 119. David wrote most of the Psalms. And in the New Testament, sometimes when Psalms are not identified as David's, the New Testament tells us that David wrote it. Look at verse 33. And I prayed this. I got down on my knees as a teenager, and I prayed this over and over and over to the point I almost had it learned. Now, I don't memorize Scripture, but I, I've read it so many times, it kind of stuck. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I'll make a deal with you. I made a deal with God when I was a teenager. You teach me, I'll keep it until the end. And you see, here's the thing. I was studying the Sabbath. I was studying the Holy Days, and I still wasn't sure. And I read all the books, pro and con. I read all kinds of books against the Sabbath, and I read a few that were for it. And I was so confused. And I said, God, I'll make a deal. You teach me your way, and I'll do it. If you show me, I promise you, I'll do it. Next verse, give me understanding, and I'll keep your law. I said, Lord, I am willing to do it. If Saturday is the Sabbath, if Sunday's the Sabbath, if Friday, the Muslims, or some other day, just tell me, and I'll do it, God. Is that your attitude? I don't answer out loud, but just think about it. Are you willing to do whatever God tells you to do in order to please your Lord and Savior? You give me understanding, and I'll keep your law. Yea, yea, which means yes, I shall observe it with my whole heart. I'm making a deal with you. You let me understand the truth, and I'll do it. And God will take you up on it. Luke 19, Jesus said, Out of thine own mouth I will judge thee. You say you'll do it? Are you sure you'll do it? Yes, sir, Lord, I'll do it. Okay, get ready. Here it comes. And God will open up your mind to understand the Scripture, but if you're not willing to do it, God will just say, forget that. True story. When I was studying, for example, the Sabbath, 
I was a teenager. I was in the 11th grade. And I shared with my, my uh, geometry teacher what I was studying. I said, you know, I've been studying this so much and I still don't understand it. And I told him, I said, but if I find out this is true, I'm going to do it. Or if I find out that Sunday is commanded in the New Testament, I'll do that. Whatever it says. I said, but you know, I've already made up my mind that if God shows me that the Sabbath is on Saturday, I'm going to do that too. And I asked him, I said, Mr. So-and-so, and I still remember his name, but he might, who knows, he might be watching. And I, I said, uh, if you found out that Saturday was the Sabbath, would you keep that day? And I've never forgotten his response, and I can quote it ver verbatim what he told me. He looked at me and he said, you know, Keith, I really don't know. I just don't know, quote, unquote. And, of course, God heard him say that. So why should God give you more truth when you're not doing what he's already shown you? Why would God give him the truth about that when, God, when he just stood there and said, I don't know if I do that or not. But I told God, I will do it if you'll teach me. I'm only a teenager. I don't know much. I'm not real smart. I don't have a lot of maturity. I sure don't know Hebrew and Greek. But God, if you'll give me understanding, I'll do it. And he took me up on it. There were times when I'd go out and pray at night and I'd say, God, just speak to me and tell me the answer. And he wouldn't do it. Because the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Study. And so God made me study. And I would, my uncle uh, was a Pentecostal preacher, and I gave him a bunch of literature, and I said, read this and tell me, is it true or not? And about a month later, I was so eager waiting for him to tell me, and he came back, and he brought it back to me in the package I had given it to. I'd written, put a string around it or something. He gave it back to me. Just like the one talent guy I said, here it is. I laid it up in a napkin. He said, I haven't had time to look at it. Nobody would take the time to help me, and it was just me and God. Nobody. Now, I had my reference books. I had Unger's Bible Dictionary. I had the commentary. I had my concordance. But nobody would sit down and guide me or help me. I couldn't find anybody to help me. In a way, that was good because that way of just me and God, and I could get on my knees and hear whatever God had to say. And I kept telling God, I'd read this over and over and over and over and over. Lord, give me understanding. And he did. Yes, sir. Well, then probably just like you didn't know and didn't want to find out. <laughs> you wanted to find out. They didn't. I wanted to find out so I could obey God. Yeah. But that's still hard. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies, meaning your law, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. Quicken me in your way. Establish your word. And this is what I was praying as a teenager. Establish your word to your servant who's devoted to your fear. Verse 40, I've longed after your precepts. Quicken me in your righteousness. The definition of righteousness is given in Deuteronomy 6.25. It's all of God's commandments, keeping all of his commandments. Look at uh, verse 43. I done looked at that. Let's see. Look at uh, verse 18 now. Go back to verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Verse 73 on the next page here. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Why do I want understanding? It's so I can learn your commandments. Look at verse 97. Verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. Have you ever said that to God? I love your law. It's my meditation. I think about it all the day. I woke up last night for something, and I was thinking about how great God was. And I laid there for an hour just thinking about how great God is, how he's blessed me, he's answered my prayers. I, I even thought about the file cabinets he'd given me. I mean, why would God condescend to someone like me and, give, and provide for my needs when I'm, I'm nobody great? I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not the president. I'm not some rich person. I'm just, I'm just me. And yet God condescends to even provide for my needs. God is so great. He is so great. Verse 98, through your commandments, you've made me wiser than my enemies. Verse 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep your word. Verse 124. Deal with your servant according to your mercy. Teach me your statutes. Verse 126. It's time for you, Lord, to work for they, the enemies of God, have made void thy law. Not the apostles. Romans 3.31. Paul said, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. We establish the law. Well, then who's, make it, who's making it void? The false prophets. People like Andy Stanley who says the Ten Commandments have been done away. That's amazing. Oh, you shouldn't name names. I just named one. 
Verse 142, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Thy law is the truth. People say, oh, I wish I knew the truth. It's God's law. That right there is the truth. 162, I rejoice that thy word is one that finds great spoil. Verse 171, my lips shall utter praise when you've taught me your statutes. The next verse, verse 172, all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I have longed for your salvation, O Lord. Your law is my delight. Now you want to know why David was a man after God's own heart. Do you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? Do what David did. Love the law. Study the law. Make it your meditation day and night. And you hear a preacher on TV who says, oh, it's all been done away. Just turn him off. Just turn him off. Now, in conclusion, I want to go to a few verses in the New Testament. In John chapter 8. Well, Pastor, you know, the yes. people are saying that the law in the Bible is all done away with. You know, they say the same thing about the Constitution. Yeah, sure. They are. And if the Constitution is done away, then That's we have total anarchy. From, you know? Yeah. In John 8 and verse 31, Jesus said this. Now, he's saying this to those who believed on him. Let me read the whole verse. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Anybody can run his big mouth and say, I'm a disciple. I believe in the Lord. No, if you continue his word, then he'll call you a disciple. I can call myself a Christian all I want to, but if Jesus doesn't call me a Christian, I'm lost. Yes, ma'am. What is the Greek word for word in that chapter? What is he saying for the, for the Old Testament, the scriptures? The Greek word would either be rhema or logos. Uh, probably in the accusative voice here it would be logon. It's the same thing or something like that. Uh, I don't know whether that's rhema or logos. I'm not sure. Okay. But either way, we are to continue, and we're supposed to live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. That's rhema. And then when you write the rhema down, it becomes the logos. If you continue, then you're my disciples indeed. So I call myself a Christian, and I go around, I'm a big blowhard, and I go to every church, and I say, I'm a Christian. Look, I carry my Bible. I'm a, I'm a Christian. But if Jesus doesn't say, yes, you are a Christian, then it doesn't matter, does it? Logos, okay. So that's the written word. And you shall know the truth if you continue in his word, because his word is truth. John 17, 17, God's word is truth. If you continue in my word, you'll know the truth, because this is the truth, and the truth will make you free. I don't go into debt in December. Do you? But some people, have they don't have enough money to buy all those many, many, many Christmas presents, so they have to put it on their credit card. And I heard about one man, he was still paying off his Christmas debts all the way into March. That's ridiculous. Tuition, yeah. Christmas yeah, we've had people drop out of school and couldn't learn the truth of God because of that. It puts you in bondage, but the truth will set you free. And it ain't even Christ's birthday. It's not even his birthday, so you're not honoring Christ. It's a winter solstice celebration, which was in honor of the pagan sun god. Luke 14, if you got your Bibles, you may want to turn there, or at least listen very carefully. Luke 14, great multitudes went with Jesus and he turned and said to them. A lot of these great multitudes were beginning to believe he was the Messiah. Here's what he said. If any man come to me. Now, you know, we give altar calls. I, I say we. I mean, most churches give altar calls. People come forward. They come to Christ. This is Luke 14, verse 25. They come to Christ. But here's what Jesus said in verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not. His father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I can go around here like a big blowhard and say, I'm a disciple, I'm a disciple, I'm a Christian. If I'm not willing to do what Christ said, he said, you're not going to be my disciple. I won't accept you. Salvation's a two-way street. Most churches say, receive Jesus. That's half of it. If he doesn't receive you, you're not a disciple. Are you willing to count the cost? of discipleship. Now somebody says, I gotta hate my parents. Well, don't turn there for time's sake, but you may want to write this down. Genesis 29 verses 30 through 31 explain what it means to hate somebody. The Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, so he loved them both. 
The next verse says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. So hated in the Bible refers to loving less by comparison. Don't go home and punch out your, your mom now and say, I hate you. Don't do that. <laughs> but it means you love Jesus more than your own mother, your own father, your own husband, your own children. I dated somebody here not too long ago who said, you mean you'd put God ahead of even your own children? I said, yes. God comes first above everybody. They can't save you. No, your children can't save you and don't want to. And Christ died for me, so I put Christ way ahead of parents. My parents got so mad at me when I walked away from the Methodist church. I'd even been sprinkled. And I walked away from it. And I said, well, and I was respectful. I just said, look, I just can't do that anymore. You cannot be my disciple. Now, let's say you want to come to work for the XYZ Corporation. Let's say I'm chairman of the board. I want to come to work for you. I see myself as an employee. Yeah, but I don't see you as an employee. And I'm the boss. Just because you want to come to work for the XYZ Corporation doesn't mean I have to accept you. See, the same thing is true when you become a Christian. Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to obey me. Yeah, but I want to be a disciple. That's dandy, but you're not going to be. He said, you cannot be. He will not accept you. And whosoever does not bear his cross, whatever your burden happens to be, he, and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Your cross is whatever you have to bear to follow Christ. And I knew a man, his wife said, it's me or your religion. And he let her go. And he loved that woman. He was in his mid-30s, and he was telling me, he says, man, it's so hard, I'm... I can never get remarried again. He was in a church that said that there's no acceptance. You cannot be divorced and ever remarried. He said, this is it. I got to stay single. To it's not biblical. But he believed it, and yet he was willing to pay the price. He believed he would have to be celibate for the rest of his life, have no companionship. He was in his mid-30s. He told me how hard it was being single now. You mean to tell me he let his wife go and wouldn't let that church go? He, he wouldn't let God go. That's how he looked at it. What? Yeah, he his he was in a church that said for no reason can you ever be remarried ever well, if you're divorced. Right. But see, that's not what the Bible says. That's right. yeah. The Bible says if the unbelieving depart, let him go. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. The Amplified says is not bound. So he technically was not bound. He was free to remarry, but his church told him no, you can't remarry. So he thought if I let her go, I'll have to be single the rest of my life, and he was willing to bear that cross. I have to admire that. He loved that woman so much that eventually he left that church and tried to get her back. Okay. He really loved his wife, but he was willing to let his wife go. Would you be willing to let your husband go or your wife go? Would you be willing? Yes, sir. Can you imagine that she had, if he had walked away from that church that he would have still been able to keep his wife? He could still <laughs> serve God with her. Y yep, but else, but you know? he thought his church was teaching the truth, and I admire that. He was doing what he thought was right. And I told God, I'll stand out on, in the front yard in my head every, every Tuesday if it's in the Bible. You just show me. I'll do it. And so this man thought, I have to let my wife go. But if she gave him the ultimatum to choose between her and God, he did the right thing by letting her go. He did the right thing by letting her go. That was his cross. Now, that may not be your situation. Well, when he met out that church, wasn't right. He should have let them go, too. He did. He did. He let them go. The book of Acts says, be a Berean and check on it. Don't check on it. Don't go by your pastor. Well, and That's true. But understand his attitude. If this is true, I will obey it. That's the point I want to make. And that's the same for everybody in this room and everybody watching online. If it's true, you need to say, I'll do it even if I lose my parents, if I lose my wife, my husband, my children, if they all reject me. If even the church you go to rejects you, I will serve Jesus Christ. That's a hard thing to do. I'm holding you over time here. Let me finish here. Yes, we've got a prayer request. Thank you. So are you willing to forsake all? Peter said, you don't need to turn there, but Matthew 19, 27, Peter said, Lord, we have forsaken all, and we followed you. Are you so sold out to Christ that you're willing to give up your job? If God told you you ought to give up that wonderful, good-paying job, your home, your possessions, your spouse, are you willing to give up your country? What if God said, leave America, don't ever come back, Go to India, sit in a teepee, and go over there and witness and be a missionary. Oh, I want to do that. No TV, no electricity, no air conditioning in the summer. But would you do it if Jesus Christ told you to do it? Now, don't everybody rush out and do that. I'm saying if he told you to do it. 
If you had to give up your livelihood and the comforts of life, are you willing to pay that kind of a price? When I was 16, I was really struggling because I thought, what if God told me that I couldn't get married if I served him? What if God told me I could never get married? And I, of course, didn't believe that would happen. But you know, I still haven't had a wife all these years. I'm not saying that, I, that, that God is telling you that, but I had to be willing to serve Christ. I mean, I mean, any one of us could, could be married if you're willing to marry a non-Christian or somebody who doesn't believe in the truth of God. You had a chance. You could have been married several years ago to that gentleman who, you know, who we're talking about. So if, if, you know, if you're not willing to totally surrender to Christ, you can have a lot of stuff in this life, but it's only temporary. But then you lose your eternal reward. So are you willing to do whatever? And I told I struggled. I struggled. Then finally, I said, okay, God, I'd be willing. Even if you said never to get married, never to have a family, I want to follow you. That's more important than anything else. That's a hard. Now, I don't want you to answer out loud, but you think about that. How much are you willing to forsake? How much are you willing to give up to follow Jesus Christ? And if you're not willing to do those things, he says, not me, he says, you cannot be my disciple. You applied. You tried to get saved. You wanted to be in the kingdom. He says, no, no, I don't receive you. I reject you. I'm not going to receive you. If he doesn't receive you, you cannot be his disciple. Same thing with a big corporation. If they don't accept your application, you're not going to have the job. Any questions, comments before we go? I'll give you something to think about. Let me say this, and we'll take this prayer request. If you think about it, there is nothing in this lifetime for 70 or 80 years or even 100 years that's worth losing a reward that lasts for eternity. There's just nothing. Because 100,000 years from now, you won't even remember what you wanted so bad. You know, like that new car. Oh, you just wanted that new car so bad. And then in 20 years, you know where that car's going to be? Sitting out in a junkyard somewhere in all likelihood. Don't, don't, don't sell out Christ for a car or for a job or even for a spouse or for whatever it is that you think you just can't live without. We have a... Um, a prayer request from uh, Randy. Do you know what the prayer request is? Yes. Um, you know, his wife was is pregnant, and he sent us a private message on Facebook that said that she's been in labor for the last 40 hours. Oh. And the doctor said that it could be even longer. I didn't think that they, I, I've never had a baby, but I didn't think they would leave you in labor that long. Yeah, you'd think they had induced the, the she, delivery. That's what I would have thought. They would have taken the baby by now. That can't be healthy. Okay, and then we can all, he I'll said, pray and y'all can be in agreement. He said, and he's even trying, he said, I'm trying to tune in as much as I can to the sermon this morning at the hospital with my wife. She is finally sleeping, but has been in labor now for 40 hours, and the doctor thinks it's going to be a lot longer. Please keep Nadine in your prayers, and that was at quarter to 11. Okay, um, about an hour ago. Maybe she's had a baby by now. Eastern time? I don't know. I don't know how many, what the Well, it'd be a quarter to 11 on your phone. It's quarter to 11 time. on our phone. Yeah, so that's our time. Our time. Whatever it is in his time. I don't know what the time difference is where he's at. He's well, in Saskatchewan. Yeah, that's, well, that's the same time. Saskatchewan is on the eastern part. Let's, uh, I'm going to pray and you be in agreement. We're going to ask. That's, that can't be go. safe. Yeah. Father, we pray now for Nadine, that she'll have that baby, that the labor will be finished, that, that, that they can go ahead and take that child now and let that child be born today and that everything will be fine and that mother and child will be absolutely healthy and, and this will be behind her. And we ask you now to just go ahead and just bless uh, her having this baby. Let her go ahead and have that baby right now and uh, without any more labor pains. And we believe we receive. Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive and you'll have it. And two are in agreement. We have two or more in agreement. We're in agreement as Christians, as brethren and brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask you for our brother Randy and for his wife, we ask you for our sister Nadine up in Canada that you would just let this occur real quickly and she'll be through with this labor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We believe it's done. And Randy, we believe it's done. Amen. Well, I'm sorry I kept you a little bit over time today. I try not to do that too often. Hope you didn't get mad at me.
Yes, sir. You were talking about people hating each other. Mm -hmm. My mother told me when I was 11 years old she hated me. She told, she told you she hated you. I don't think she meant that she loved Jesus more, though, did she? No, she, she wasn't going to church. Yeah, she wasn't going to church. So. She wasn't going to church. Either. We'll see you Thursday. Okay, Thursday. I was getting ready to say, we will be here Thursday morning. 1030. 10.30. Tell your boss you got to go to church. And we'll see you Thursday. And for those of you who are students, we'll see you. Uh, Carolyn, we'll see you Monday night, too. And we'll see, see Wendy Wednesday. She can be out in the parking lot looking. And Mahesha Bell Wednesday. Yeah, we'll see you all Wednesday. Take care. God bless. We're yeah. dismissed.